It is the Anfield rap, Neil Atkinson in the chair. Uh, the Sunday after the Friday when Liverpool beat Everton and the Sunday after the Saturday when Liverpool sold Phil Coutinho. In front of me, I've got Adam Smith, Rob Gutman and Dan Morgan. Very soon we'll be jo- joined by Paul Joyce over the phone uh, talking about the Coutinho deal. We are going to go on to talk about Everton. Normally we put the game first, but Liverpool have sold a player for £142 million. Pounds, um, and that's where we're going to start. Um, going to go to Rob Gutman first. Um, Coutinho, the, we, 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 you and I had a chat on tour player last night about it, but he's gone. Um, he hasn't conducted himself well. I think. I think it's a shame. I think it's a real. Sh- it's a. It's a massive shame. Actually, it would have been great for him to have got a, a valedictory performance against Everton. But part of the entire strategy was to remove the idea of valedictory performances. Yes, he gave us five years, but I, I can't help but be vaguely irritated and annoyed and really rather sour over the the the, the, the nature of what the football has done uh, in August, but doubling down on it in January. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he's given us five years, but it wouldn't have hurt him really to have given us another four months. We, he can't play in the Champions League. We're having a nice. We've got the prospect of a Champions League run here. You know, he's he's waited this long to to play in in the knockout phase of, of the Champions League for Liverpool. That's that's it. You know, okay, Naby Keita hadn't been at Leipzig very long, so it's a slightly different case. But he did. But he was. He did buy into the idea that he owed Leipzig a Champions League season to have stood by us for another three or four months to to, to be there for us, possibly in one of the big stadiums, doing doing stuff for Liverpool. He could have left with his head held high. That don't think any of us. Be, any of us would have really begrudged him leaving in the summer. Yeah, and I, I must admit, I, I'm flicking through my my social media and seeing wincing when I'm seeing these little early pictures of him in Barcelona kits. I'm not I'm not enjoying this at all. It seems like there's been quite the the gamble from him, but also another gamble from the club. Dan Liverpool of of giving him what he wanted. Uh, he's got his move. Liverpool, I think, have been pretty adequately compensated. Other the market can get carried away, and you can you can lose your, lose your place in it. He's the second highest uh, signing ever. Uh, in the history of the game, um, second only to uh, will become second. Sorry to Mbappe, third to Mbappe. Sorry, Mbappe will overtake this summer when that happens. But that's the that's the level of of, of money Liverpool have got for him. Are you happy with it? In the context of when he's gone and how he's gone, like you mentioned, um, no, because I, I view money in in this in this world and this planet of of modern day elite football as just a. a a non-entity almost that sometimes it, it I don't think it carries as much sway as it used to in latter year. Um it's very disappointing as Rob says. You you see a player who I was looking at photos and videos of him yesterday from when we first signed him and he's a boy. He's a he's a young boy and he's got this beaming smile and curly hair and you grow with him. Over five years you grow with him as a person. You've seen him become a man. And to get the feeling that he suddenly then feels that He's outgrown Liverpool in some way. is uh, is is quite disappointing. And look, he's he's a fantastic player. He's on the trajectory to being one of the top five players in the world. If you'd ask me right now, um, but in terms of how he's gone and when he's gone, I don't think it's great for the club. Um, what we do now going forward is important. What we do in this month is important for me. Um, but I completely echo what Rob says in that. There's no harm in him staying till the summer, even if the deal would have been agreed now for the summer. I think that would have been the best the best outcome for all parties. But he has behaved in a way that I think has been hinted to in Klopp's comments behind the scenes in terms of it was affecting the players or he made it clear to the players um, that he wanted this move. So he's behaved in a way that has been um, disruptive. There's no doubt about that. And I think that if that is the case and it certainly has been the case then it's been the manager who's made this decision and I'm fully off that view He's made a, that's a really good point Dan's made there about the players I noticed that in Klopp's talk and I think it'll be glossed over because he talked about a wide range of things but he said he he, he talked to his teammates about this yeah. it would only take him to pour his heart out to a Firmino t- yeah, to, yeah. to a, a Jordan Henderson for them to go as a delegation to the manager, let's imagine, and go, you know what, the boy really wants it, Jürgen. Yep. Before it becomes a cancer in a dressing room and people think it's very easy to go, just make him stay, just make him stay. I think that's the reality sometimes what you're up against. Philip was insistent with me, the owners and even his teammates. This was a move he was desperate to make happen. Mm. It says a lot, though. I think... I, I've, got quite, I've got quite a lot to say on this, I think. And I, I, for starters, I think the... I, 
I know it's easy to jump on the club's back and say they should have just made him do this, they should have just made him do that, blah, blah, blah. But I think the club are a little bit in a rock and a hard place here for a number of reasons. I think that is part of it, definitely, that idea of it being a bit of a, of a cancer in the dressing room, as Rob says. And, I, you know, I, as daft a comparison as it is, we may well have all been in a room at some point where somebody's had an argument, you know, massive big argument, and we all try to carry on as if nothing's going on or, you know, you try to ignore it or pretend it never happened. But that you can't do it. Human beings cannot do that. And it's easy to say footballers should just go, oh, we're, you know, just get on with the game, blah, blah, blah. But, but you can't do that. And Coutinho, I think, has been visibly unhappy at the club for some time now. I know on, on the show the other week, on the Gutter Show, Mike Nevin talked about, you know, we started smiling when he got the captain's armband. I, I must have missed those matches because I haven't seen him smile for about six months even when he scored an absolute world he's, he's not been happy at the club he wanted to go in the summer he made that absolutely clear I think Klopp wanted to uh, you know I think Klopp would have accepted him going in the summer you know the words that he said the likes of decisions are made by those higher up than me when he said that everybody thought oh because he was going then they're going to sell him what I think what Klopp meant was I'd, just, I'd sell him but the the, the owners want to, want, to, want to make a point to Barcelona to keep him here. Klopp has long been a manager that doesn't want players against their will. He, he just doesn't he doesn't do it. He talks about how he you know they wept in each other's arms when Goethe left Borussia Dortmund. He is he doesn't keep players when they don't want to be there and they don't want to play for him. And I think part of that is because it's very very difficult to convince that player to then give you everything you've got if you've got a big say say the get say the season like last season came up to you know one big game to get into the Champions League and he's saying, listen, lads, you know, push through. We're in the, we get the Champions League next season. We get European football. Continue saying, I don't care, mate. I'm going to Spain. I've got Europe. I've got Champions League. Play anyway. through minor injury. Uh, well, yeah, I've, you know, play through a small injury. No, mate, I've got the World Cup coming up. I'm not going to. You know, and you made a really good point on on one of the specials, Rob. I think where you said, you know, he he was injured all through August when the transfer window was open. He well, he will probably have been injured all through January when the transfer window was open. And come April, he might well have been injured throughout April and May because the World Cup's coming up. You know, it, it's not... I think it's very, very difficult for the manager to turn around and say, we just force him to stay here and it's that simple. And I also think that part of the reason for that is because you then have other players who are maybe considering signing for the football club looking at the situation and going, well, I want to end up at Real Madrid. I want to end up at Barcelona and I don't want to sign for a club that won't let me do that. And they are, we cannot win an arms race against Manchester United, Manchester City, Chelsea. We know we can't do that. One thing we can do is do something slightly cleverer box a bit cleverer and we, we talk about you've spoken in the past Neil about things like building a prayer room for Mane you've spoken about how uh, Salah's uh, you know being African and being Egyptian really matters to him and I think the manager's been very intelligent with letting him go to this uh, African player of the year award because that is a slight thing that future players go something that matters to me the club will let me do and we can all say yeah but we should be as big as Barcelona we should be as big as Real Madrid but we're not and and frankly, I'm not entirely convinced we ever have been. I don't know in the 80s if a, if we had a, a massive Spanish player at the time, if Real Madrid or Barcelona had come in for them, they'd have stayed with us, even though we were within European Cups and things. We lost and, we lost lads who were born and bred Liverpool fans. Exactly to, to, to those. In the and, 80s. and that. So yes, we are. We want us to get back to winning and the, and the more we win the more likely it is that we'll be able to keep players but Cristiano Ronaldo left Manchester United after they'd just done the double because he wanted to go to Real Madrid and Barcelona. So I really don't think it's as simple as just saying he's on a contract, you keep him here and he plays brilliantly and it's a World Cup year. He's going to the World Cup anyway. Uh, it doesn't matter. Adam, here's an interesting case in point. People often assume that, the, that there are case studies of players being forced to stay that extra year. Ronaldo isn't forced to stay. He's persuaded to stay. I thought for a good while that we'd forced Luis Suarez to stay that extra year that he sulked, he striked, he realised we weren't budging, we weren't selling him to Arsenal, he was forced to stay. But then you read Gerard's biography and some of the memoirs back, he, Gerard and Rogers to an extent persuade Luis Suarez to stay. Gerard says to Luis Suarez, don't go to Arsenal, we'll give us another year and you'll get a big Spanish club. So we don't force Luis Suarez to stay, we talk him into it. Now by sounds of what Klopp's saying uh, in, in his, his comments yesterday, we tried really hard to keep to Philip Coutinho. We've built the case as much as we can in the face of Barca's pressure. We've offered more money. We've thrown the captaincy at him. We've said, go on, just give it one more year, Phil. And he still doesn't want to do it. We can't force him. I don't think you really can force. I think Klopp's been backed into a corner in a couple of ways in that whether we like it or not, he's a, he's a humanist and he sees the human being rather than the asset. Now, if Coutinho's been going into him for the last few months, 
visibly and emotionally upset and saying, I really want this move, I really need this move, then I think Klopp sees him as someone who I think he has to he feels like he has to do that for the sake of the, the human being. If he thinks if it's affecting his life and his personal life, I think he sees that over him being a cog in the machine in his Liverpool side and, and whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. But I think what's also may have happened is that when it when it was muted that Liverpool had softened their approach, if it, it then quickly got out that via the press that this could be Klopp's decision or the decision could be left with Klopp to, to have the final say on it. Now, if he's been playing good cop all summer, saying to Coutinho, lad, I, I'd, I'd, be the one to, I'd be the first one to let you go if it was my decision, but it's not. It's them baddies in America, they're keeping you there to keep him on board, to keep him in the side, to keep him playing. Then as soon as that's been switched, Coutinho's knocking on his door first thing on, on January 1st, saying, well, you've been saying for six months, mate, that if it was your decision, you'd let me go. They're saying now it's your decision. What, what's and, the score? And Dan, he does say in August, I, I, I caveat what I just said about you can't force them. You can ask them to be reasonable. And in August, he said, you've come to us too late. We can't get a replacement. It's not reasonable. So he thought both of us have to be human and reasonable. But as you say, come the winter, Coutinho's within his rights. You go, you've had time. You've had time to look for someone now. I also think there's something in the fact that we we cannot, I don't think you can, celebrate the signing of Virgil van Dijk and then bemoan the sale of Louis of Philippe Coutinho in the same breath because we've been the bigger we we are the bigger club van Dijk has waited and waited and waited and then we've turned around and said here's the money that you've said it will take to release this player give him to us and fans are going brilliant we've signed this defender that we all desperately wanted you can't then say when another bigger club has essentially done that to us that's disgraceful why hasn't the club held on to him blah blah I think you know I mean football is hypocrisy it always has been and it always will be it you know it it's smoke and mirrors and it's lies and I think when we come on to talk about the idea of who we're going to you know replace uh, Coutinho with I keep going to say Suarez which is an interesting little Freudian slip um, but <laughs> But who are we going to replace uh, Coutinho with? I think this is all smoke and mirrors as well, the rumours of who we're linked with, blah, blah, blah. But I, I just think it's it's very, very... I think people want things in absolutist terms. This is somebody's fault. You know, we should have just forced Coutinho to stay. We should have done this. It, life doesn't exist in 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 uh, in those absolutist terms. And I think Dan's absolutely right that Jurgen Klopp is a humanist manager. And if he's going to take that sort of approach, then he's not going to view things in absolutes. If you're staying here, you're seeing it, you're contracting. It's as simple as that. What I'm beating in 17. And it's worth pointing that out that you know we're unbeaten in seventeen with the footballer, so it isn't as though it's you know you're using the phrase cancer in the dressing room. I think it's the idea that this could get worse, that this can become an ongoing problem, not the idea that it has been a problem because you don't get to be unbeaten in seventeen yeah. if this is a problem. And I think that that you know so I think that's the first thing to say. The other thing to say though, Rob, is is that the optics of it it doesn't look good and I don't think it is good and I don't think it's good to be selling your best player in in, in, in January I completely understand that Latin American footballers are going to want to go and play for Barcelona and Real Madrid I completely understand that but we, we, we do have our own wants and needs and I understand the idea of you, you that you are sort of in a position where you want to put something over that you want to be able to you know you want to be able to say well you know what we we do look to develop you we know what we're about you know forgetting even having a size of club comparison but I do think you've got to punch weight at some point my thing here is is there's a ton of issues one of which is Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool have just now given you any footballer you dare to mention your way home if you ever want to leave Liverpool that's what they've done. They've said this is how you, this is how you do it. This is the path. So he can be the humanist manager that you're referring to there, but he's a human. If he, if he is the humanist manager that Dan Morgan's referring to, Rob, then now if you are Mo Salah and you're thinking in a couple of months, in, in in a year's time, year and a half's time, you'd like to do the same thing. You've now been given the roadmap as to how you do it. Yes, but not at the end of this season, because here's an example. That's a very interesting case in point, Mo Salah. I don't think Mo Salah, Real Madrid could knock for Mo, Mo, Mo Salah. Continue scoring at this rate. There's already been murmurs about Real Madrid and Zidane fancying him. They could knock for him in, in May, right? I think we can reasonably. I think Jurgen Klopp, with with a, with with, with uh, keep uh, his conscience intact, can say no. Mo, one season isn't reasonable. Next year, okay, that's a discussion. Next year's a discussion. Uh, 
So what? So so what am I saying that within two years we have to put up with the fact that we could lose a player within two years of signing him if a big, bigger, richer club comes knocking? Yeah, I am saying that, but it's it's only a factor of the fact that we developed a player to be that bloody good. If we if we develop players at the rate we're developing, eighteen months rewind, eighteen months ago it's just Phil Coutinho who's who's potentially a target but for the top. There's huge pressure. I take your point, but there's huge pressure on recruitment here, and that what you're basically saying is you need to go and find another Mo Salah. They don't get so good, yeah, such good to, players. And you need to keep doing that. No, no, not, not don't keep such good players. It is the idea that at some point, and I'm happy for it to, you know, I'm happy to say, I'm not happy to say, but at some point, I think you've got to be able to front one down. Now, I think Coutinho, you can tell the story of, well, he's been here five years. This has happened and this has happened. And, and by the way, they're five years without a trophy. But at some point, you have to be able to face one down. You have to be able to say, even in two years, no, sorry, mate. That you, you, if, if, if you cannot keep throwing your hands up to the inevitable and going, well, what are we meant to do? You I'm not can't saying, keep doing that. I'm not. But I think it's. I look, Neil. I think it's, at some point you yeah. end up with shitter players. I don't. I don't. I don't entirely disagree. But it's it's cases on merit. I mean, look, we we persuade we we do we persuade Suarez to stay for an extra year, don't we? Um, I, as far as I we know, Coutinho could have come under pressure from PSG a year ago anyway, and maybe we have maybe we have taken him a year and a half past. You have to look at it on its merits. At the end of the day, you can say we have to make a stand, but it might it may be on most most Salah, and we may get away with it on most Salah. We may force him, and he may talk to his agent and go, yeah, okay, I'm going to knock all down, or he may commit kick up the biggest stink we've ever seen in the history of the frigging game. Um, Southampton has just tried to stare out Virgil van Dijk. Didn't play out very well for them. I suppose the, the point of it is, is each case is a judgment call. This one has been Klopp's call. He will live or die by this one. I, well, not live or die, but he will, he will pay some consequences of it. And I suppose all I, I'm arguing, I'm not saying he's right, but I fully understand why he might have had to make the call he's had to make here. OK, uh, earlier I spoke to Paul Joyce uh, about all of this, the way in which it's played out, the way, in which, uh, the way in which the story's gone and what happens next. This is what he had to say. Paul Joyce of The Times joining me now to talk about Philip Coutinho leaving Liverpool and what happens next from this stage, Paul. But let's start with what's happened. It seems as though, from the outside looking in, the player has made it exceptionally clear that he was not prepared to play for Liverpool again. Is that? Do you think that's a fair statement? Um, I, I think it's, it's 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 clear that he stressed to the club that he wanted to move to Barcelona. So part of me still wonders, and it will never know now if Liverpool had said, "No, you're only going in in the summer." Would he have fallen back into line um, in, in sort of February time once the window had, had gone? We'll never know that, but I think it's clear that. Coutinho's wish was to move now. He didn't want to wait until the summer. I think there was incentives for Barcelona to maybe get a lower fee in the summer if they if they were willing to shelve their interest for a few months. But everybody's pushed for it now. And the debate is whether Liverpool should have dug in regardless. Um, I can see both sides of it, really. It's been a very complex issue throughout and... You know, as you said then, the, the key now is, is what happens next from the pool. On just on this one, I mean, it seems as though you know it sounds as though Liverpool. You're saying that Liverpool there have offered incentives to Barcelona. They seem to have offered incentives to to Coutinho as well. Is this is this linked yeah. to the World Cup, Paul? Is it linked to the Nike stuff? Is it just that the player the player is desperate to play for Barcelona? Is it a combination of all the above? I think essentially it's a South American player. You know, wants to play for his dream club. His dream club isn't Liverpool. His dream club is Barcelona or Real Madrid. And when they come in, it's very difficult to, to turn that down. He, he's lived through the disappointment of the summer of the deal not happening in the summer. And you know, I think Liverpool were prepared to offer you know more money now to him to stay until the summer. You know, in one sense, is it refreshing that? It's not about money, it's just about playing for the club that Coutinho wants to play for. This has been a dream for him. So we say that footballers are greedy and motivated by money. Well, maybe in this case it's not been about that so much. It's just somebody following a dream that that dad for a as a young boy. And it's difficult for you know to maybe hit 
विषय so how can he do this to us? But you know, he's not somebody. You know, I think with a lot of South American players, their dream is to get to La Liga and play for Barcelona and Real Madrid. It, it isn't Liverpool. So looking forward now, Paul. I mean. It- Liverpool, the ownership of Liverpool, the boards of Liverpool, the manager really, they put themselves under a, under a fair bit of pressure. This was a season where, for the first time in a long time, they had a, had a wealth of attacking riches, and now there's, there's you know throughout the club, there's now a lot of pressure, isn't there, to to to, to get back yeah. to that situation, to replace and to move quickly. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the biggest. When we talk about the sort of the timing of it, that's the biggest issue, isn't it? It's the pressure and the and the gamble that they've taken now in sanctioning the deal. Um, you know, looking at second place, really, that the way the team has been playing, 17 matches unbeaten, everybody will see there's an opportunity in the Champions League to, to, go, on, to go on. So, they're, they're the unknowns now, how this will affect. I mean, Klopp will obviously have faith in his squad, he has got a lot of players. Um, I'm not sure whether he will want to spend now, if I'm being honest. I wonder whether he'll just maybe try and go with what he's got because he has got belief in, you know, Adam Lallard, who's not been fit and is now fit again. He's got faith in Oxley chamberlain there's, there's Mane, there's Firmino, there's you know, Mo Salah. So, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, Liverpool don't go into the transfer market straight, straight away. Equally, if they were to, you know, suffer a, suffer a few, you know, challenging results, then equally, I wouldn't be surprised if they looked at it again. I think the rest of the month's going to be very interesting how it plays out, whether they hold the nerve because Liverpool will feel this is not just about the rest of the season. They'll, they'll say it's about two seasons. Um, so yeah. I think it's going to be really interesting, as you say, how, how the next how the next month, the rest of the month plays out. Do you think that? So you think that that is driven by the idea? Because I, because you know, sitting from where I am, I know that there'll be a lot of people questioning the ownership. Um, and yeah. are you of the view that if Liverpool don't move in the transfer market it's because the manager doesn't want to? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of sort of um, sort of focus on how it'll be Klopp's decision, but I don't think this transfer will have worked in any other different way than than any other transfer would. I mean, the sum of money is is obviously immense and that's what sets it apart but the actual process I think it will be player pushes to go owners agree a fee Klopp signs it off now that would be the same with any transfer so I think they'll be on the same page and it'll be whatever Jürgen Klopp wants to do Jürgen Klopp, they will trust Jürgen Klopp to do that Um, so obviously Liverpool supporters, you know, will want will want to trust Klopp, but at the moment there's a there's an uncertainty and a and a little bit of doubt and a little bit of disappointment around it all. And I think what it does do is, if you're one of Liverpool's rivals, then it gives you a bit of a boost because they've lost one of the the best players at a time in the season when. Rivals were probably fearing the momentum Liverpool have, so it's going to be. Listen, the bottom line is we don't know how it's going to play out, do we? If, yeah. If the if the player, and and that's the great that's the grey area. I mean, everybody wants football to be black and white. We just don't know. If they get top four and and go on a run in the Champions League, and you know, and then they buy well in the summer, does that justify it? I mean. So it's probably the impossible question, doesn't it? There'll be people who say, oh, well, we could have won. Unless we win the Champions League or yep. and finish the top four, there'll be people who will say, well, we would have done that with, with Coutinho. 
Just one last little, um, just one, one, one last little yeah. thing, Paul. Is is there an appetite amongst them? Do you think to try to get Kiter over early? Because that's the thing that surprised me when it came out. I thought that it looked pretty like it was going to be put to bed, and yet there was some reports that Liverpool had either had a look at that or had that conversation. Is that something that's feasible as far as you're concerned? Because I don't think it is. No, well, I would, I would agree with you on that. I think Leipzig have been very trenchant in stringent in what their stance is. The trouble with football is it's, it's always one yeah. phone conversation, is it? And, and it, But as it stands, I think Leipzig have made their position very clear on that. They want to keep until the end of the season because they want to get back in the Champions League. I think Liverpool would do it in a heartbeat, obviously, but you know it would take a climb down from Leipzig and as we saw in the summer, they're not inclined to really do that. Okay, uh, excellent. Really good to speak to Paul this morning as he's on his way to Shrewsbury for Shrewsbury West Ham. You'll be able to read that in the paper tomorrow. Uh, we will uh, leave him to get on with that. Looking forward to seeing David Moyes' boys. And let's get back over and we'll have a chat about Coutinho. Always good to speak to Paul there. Um, Dan Morgan. Paul Joyce suggests it's very possible that as it stands, Liverpool may not move for anyone. He obviously caveats that he knows how the business works, the business of football works. Uh, but he says that that could well be the case. Um, I think we're light. I think we're light in the front three. Um worried um, if we don't replace. I think we suddenly look and attack a light, even though Coutinho's been doing some work in attack and some work in midfield. Yeah, the front three is what worries me more than any. I think, I think a lot of this hinges on how you view Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain and I very much view him as a, a player in the midfield three because I think from his performance the other night which I'm sure we'll come to I don't think he's brilliant in the front three when he receives the ball with his back to goal and I don't think a lot of his positional play in that front three is something that he is adapted to as much as he has in the midfield so if we're looking at midfield with Oxlade-Chamberlain in there we've got six from three if there is any of Sadio Mane, Firmino or Mo Salah taken out of our front three and let's be honest the possibility of Firmino being taken out for a little while might happen now then I think we're really really short and I get that there's there's a big transfer in Thomas Lamar and whether that can happen or not in January it's probably very complicated and I'm not sure however I think it wouldn't be the worst idea to be looking at a, a wide forward centre forwards who can come in and play 15 to 20 games in that front three for Liverpool this season in the mould of an Oxlade-Chamberlain type of signing i.e. 20 to 30 million um, and then we just see where we are at the end of the season in terms of long term going forwards I'd, look I'd like to see us I'd like to see us be in the conversation for big players and if we can pay €100 million Euros for Jan Oblak this month, then go and get a world-class goalkeeper. If we can't get a forward in, where we're light, make the spine of the team stronger. You know, show show your intent. And when I say going forward, I mean that in the summer, if we sign Thomas Lamar, that's fine. If we don't, OK. If Gareth Bale suddenly becomes available, I want us to be in that conversation. If Antoine Griezmann comes available and he decides he wants to be linked with England again, I want us to be in that conversation. And I think that Liverpool now... I sort of taken two steps back from the the intent he showed with the Van Dijk transfer and the fee and I think that they have to put that right and I think it would be detrimental for us not to sign anyone this month. I, I agree, I, I broadly agree and I think, I, I mean I, I would imagine that pretty much every single Liverpool supporter is in the same boat of saying, you know, if you were given a choice of signing a player in January or not signing a player in January, every single person's going to sign in a player in January. And I, I also agree with the front three looking a little bit troublesome. But I think part of Klopp's uh, logic behind this, part of his thought process behind this, was that he's looking at a player in Coutinho that doesn't want to be at the club anymore and has made that absolutely you know clear. I also... I I'm, I've never been convinced that Klopp sees Coutinho as his sort of player. Uh, it, absolutely. In terms of... I think Coutinho will often knock back, knock off in his job of tracking back and helping out the defence, which I think Klopp sees as vitally important to how his teams play. And I think he'll be looking at this and thinking, well, do you know what? We can we lose a very, very good player. There's no question he is an exceptional player. And it, on the face of it, we are weaker without him. 
But if we ended, let's just say for argument's sake, we ended this transfer window with Lamar, Goretzka and a goalkeeper. We are stronger as a team than we were with than the team was with Vilcatinho in it. In my opinion, if we end it with a you know a top class goalkeeper, which is the which is I think the biggest area that we need to strengthen on the pitch now. So we we cannot know right now how good, bad, or otherwise this decision to let Coutinho go is, and and what Klopp's take on the transfer market is because because as Mel said in one of the specials that, that you've done recently there, there isn't there also isn't necessarily a like for like replacement of Coutinho so we, we're not going to bring in another player who does everything that he does but what we might do is bring in players that strengthen the team overall with that money and we will know on January the 31st whether this was a good transfer or a bad transfer we'll know at the end of the season definitively whether it was the right thing to do or not and in terms of the gamble the club's taken it is absolutely a gamble of course it is but it could also have been a gamble to keep hold of him because you know you there's all, it's almost like sliding doors you don't know what future players we put off coming to the club because we force someone to stay so i think it's tricky the the not Klopp's type of player thing i think is interesting we said this yesterday on the show mm. and i stand by this i don't think continue is particularly Klopp's type of player and I've, that, a couple of people have, have, have raised this with me separately and said well how can you say that x y and z my thing isn't whether or not he's a very very good player my thing or whether or not we're better with him or better without him in that you know i don't think gerard was benitez's type of player I don't think Fowler was Julier's type of player. Um, you know, I think you can. We've had successful Liverpool teams and successful Liverpool managers who've had to adapt what they'd like to do. And I think, if anything, that's actually a good thing sometimes. So that rather than you get the the managers untrammeled view he's he's, he's he's forced to I think forcing sometimes a manager to accommodate a specific talent is no bad thing no. Rob mm, I no. think that, and we, you can argue you know you can argue one way or another what you think of Coutinho in there but Rory Smith tweeted something similar where he said you know you, you might just get a team that's now more Jurgen Klopp what is noticeable is there's the stats running around I think you know you look we do perfectly well in August without Coutinho um, where you, you can see bits and pieces in there that it isn't you know what would have happened if he just broke his legs for five broke his leg for five months all of that that sort of stuff and that's all really really fair but I actually think there's a value sometimes genuinely a value sometimes in a manager having to deal with a player who may not be his type of player yes maybe we'll 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 see I think it could take us a, a year to re, to see how this all pans out and, and what type of player if it's someone like Lamar comes in if we see a different v- Klopp vision emerge I think we can probably answer that question then I think manage, I think there's a, to my mind there's a degree of bullshit around managers and their their systems and their styles like we've heard it with City oh it's a certain player will play for Guardiola Rodgers talked about tried to sort of invent the, there was a certain Rodgers player there's a certain Klopp player and a, cer- and a specific system I think players I think managers once you get them one on one will go look I'm adaptable I, I'm generally adaptable. I, I'd like to play this way. I've, I've always enjoyed that guy's kind of type of football. But if you give me some brilliant lads, I'll make this work. So I think this can be over. I I don't disagree with what both of you have said, but I think it can be overplayed. And I think, and if we look clutching at straws, that's not one of them I want to clutch at, quite frankly. It's 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 it's, it's one of the poorest. Hang on, hang on. I'm going to, I'm going to finish here. Um, <laughs> I think I was going to finish here. Now I've been totally, totally off my straw. Well, then have you got in his head? You do. You have got in my frigging head. One nil. Um, I, I, as just going back to the question which we're broadly addressing, which is the replacing of Coutinho and how we do it and when. Whilst I, I want to stay on side as long as possible with Jurgen Klopp, because I, I, I do strongly believe in the man, and I think his, I think his judgment is very, very sound. I think he's a, a wonderful manager for us to have in at this time. And I always try to think, well, why has Jurgen made this decision? I do think he and the club will leave themselves justifiably open to criticism if they do not replace or go past some way towards replacing Phil Coutinho in this window. And at the very least, if they do not explain why they're not doing it in a reasonable amount of detail, I think it's. It, it's fair that we as fans go, Jesus, this is a kick in the teeth here for us as a club. We do need to know what's happening. And uh, Jürgen comes up with a very broad statement about how they'll reinvest. Well, I think those of us those of us are sensible, <laughs> I'm going to claim that mantle, would say we do expect the club to reinvest these funds. I don't believe the nonsense conspiracy theories about how actually it's going to go in towards buying more yachts for FSG or being squirreled away in Swiss bank accounts. The money's going to get reinvested. It's just the urgency with which they feel it needs to happen. My fear, my fear is, and I can't believe it doesn't occur to the likes of Klopp, because he's a very intelligent man, 
My fear is that if you don't make a move now and you decide to stay patient and wait for the right guy, what if you don't make the Champions League? Thomas Lamar, is a, for ex- as, the, as the present example, is a very sought-after player. He's not going to pick a non-Champions League club and he's going to have a choice, I think. So that becomes a big issue. The question is, can we still make the Champions League without Coutinho? Well, yes, we've taken steps. We say we've taken two steps forward, backwards, losing Coutinho. We've taken a big one forward with Virgil van Dijk. We've got Adam Lallana back. There are things we can do to ameliorate this loss. He gambled last summer, the manager, yeah. I'd argue. Oh, yeah. not just last, sorry, not last summer, the summer of 2016, Rob, um, for everyone. But I, he gambled, I think, that summer on, we're going to get in the Champions League, I'm going to make it happen. And then we're going to invest significantly from there. And mm. he would now say, if he was sitting here, well, I've got me five players. Yes, I haven't got them all by the 1st of August, mm. but I've, I've ended up getting me five. The five that you said I wanted, a left back, a left back who was a dog chasing a ball. That one was sound, <laughs> and he was going to sort that one out. Uh, the others, uh, he wanted Van Dijk, he wanted Salah, he wanted Chamberlain, and he wanted um, and he wanted Naby Keita. And he would say, well, look, we got them all, but it's not been perfect. So he'll, th- he'll think, well, that gamble sort of paid off. My worry and what you've just described is that he gambles again. Mm. And he thinks, right, if we if we consolidate in the Champions League and I'm backing me and my boys that we can, that I can then go, right, okay, another summer where it's it's three, four big, big hitters in. We'll do it in the summer. This is how it'll work for me. I know what I'm doing. I know what we're about, and it's going to go this way. But I think that gamble is currently enormous because, to go back to what we were discussing before we spoke to Paul Joyce, if you are Mo Salah, if you are Sadio Mane, you could be well within your rights next summer to say, I want to play for a Champions League club. Yeah, You're not there, that's well different. within the right to say, I want to play for a Champions League club. And that's the gamble we're talking about here. That's the size of this gamble. It's not just the idea of buying new players or buying different players. It is the idea of getting, of keeping, even retaining the talent that you currently have. Well, I think, yeah... And I think in talking to the ownership about this one, and they will have talked for hours and in detail about this, the ownership will go, this Champions League you've got us into, it's the reason we hired you, it's worth about £100 million a season to us if you do half decent in it. That can't be sniffed at. It's not even just about attracting players and keeping players and this, that and the other. It's about staying in that competition. It's worth a fortune to the club. So Klopp... It justifies huge increases in wage bills. Yeah, yeah. So, but what we we're, we're in a look. We we are second guessing a situation here. I suppose what we're we're almost having the conversation we we might we might yet be having on the 29th of January already, and it is only the seventh today. Yeah, and uh, I think Klopp would also. I would I would suggest say that he in inverted commas or, or no. I think other people said that Klopp gambled when we didn't sign an alternative to Van Dijk in the summer. And I think Klopp would say that that decision has now been justified. I think it's justified in us having the second most clean sheets behind Manchester City by the at this point in the season. I think it's justified by the fact that we, you know, have we're now... We're top four. Yeah, we're top four. And, and you know, but for a, a couple of decisions by referees or decisions by players, we could be second in the league right now. Through in the Champions uh, League. Yeah, we're through in the Champions League. You know, we could, we could finish this season and legitimately second with an, with an FA Cup win, uh, and in and you know we could reach the semi-finals of the Champions League. And Klopp would say the, the Coutinho gamble was was a one that I think paid off. And you know, and now look what we've got. And you know, it's also worth noting that we have won games without Philip Coutinho. We beat Arsenal four 0 without them. We also lost five one to uh, Manchester City uh, without him, but we lost four one to um, Tottenham with him. So you know, he doesn't he doesn't make and break the entire team and the way that we play. So it is it is a gamble, but I think the manager might look at it and think it's a it's a it's a sensible gamble. And I think that if we look at things like, you know, when when I was talking before about not that kind of player, you know, not a Klopp kind of player, obviously in this particular instance, he has he's adapted because Phil Coutinho has been playing for us and scored some amazing goals for us. So he's ad- he has adapted his way of playing. But he and his backroom team, I, they, he often talks, when we talk about a goal that we've conceded and we concentrate on Lovren or we concentrate on Mignolet, the manager will often look and say, well, yeah, but if the player there makes the tackle or if the player there completes the pass, they could have sat there and analysed Liverpool's thing and seen that Coutinho is responsible for 12 of 15 goals. We, you know, we, we have absolutely no idea what they've done behind the scenes. So... It, 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 look, of course, it's a gamble, and we won't know until you know May how clever or otherwise a gamble it is. But perhaps it was one we're taking. We just don't know. I think the manager. I think it's a good point, Adam. I think the manager has has a bit of a, a conundrum on his hands with Coutinho. In that, I think if if Brendan Rodgers is still manager of Liverpool Football Club, I think we're all sitting here going, 
we're in real trouble here because if Phil Coutinho was playing centre mid for the Brendan Rodgers side, you're seeing a different player. Now, I think I've been slightly disappointed in him in, in centre midfield this season in terms of it was something that we were all crying out to be done um, this time last year that you you push Coutinho back and you shouldn't suddenly see him sliding those through balls in, people playing on the shoulder and we've seen very quickly and notably that Klopp's way of football doesn't really adhere to that that we all thought we would see in terms of a Coutinho in that role. I can un- completely understand the logic of him going to be the higher two in the Esther because I think it's a different kettle of fish in the league and in terms of the time you get on the ball, the types of tactics and strategy that you're coming up against. I think he will he will be able to work his magic in a much more patient and um, expansive way at Barcelona. So I can see it from that side. Um, in terms of just going back to, to what you're saying, Neil, and I'll just play devil, devil's advocate with it. If Sadio Mane or Mo Salah come up to Klopp next year and say, I want to move because Coutinho's got his move, for instance, or whatever. Klopp can, in some ways, can he not say to them, well, I signed you, so I had these conversations with you prior to the you signing, which I'm sure he has. Do you know what I mean? Coutinho's not his player is what I'm getting at. And th- there's there's external and special circumstances around Coutinho going in that he's been here five years, etc., so on and so forth. I'd like to think if Klopp sold a vision to a player to get him here, then I think them conversations in some ways have already been had. That an unspoken rule of, look, in a year's time, if it's not going the way it plans, then just be patient and I'll get us there. You could be right about that, but what I'd say is that it becomes difficult. It beca- All that becomes harder without the Champions League. Is yeah, my yeah. Point. My, and that is, this is my big thing. And, and Dan, you know, you're saying you're worried about the front three. I'm saying to you, you know, who would you have? Because that's, I think that's the next thing. There's loads of links to Mares which appeared and then disappeared and went sideways. Mares himself is a really strange footballer in that I do not understand how he's, I mean, I just don't understand how he's still at Leicester. No. He's football of the year two years ago, three years ago. He's now, you know, he's, he's he's not stopped contributing to that Leicester side. He's been slightly slightly less effective, but he's one in three this season. He's, you know, it's not as though he isn't creating opportunities. He sets up their opening goal when they come to Anfield. It's not, and that day it wasn't like he wasn't putting it in. I mean, he may not have the work rate of a, you know, I, I don't understand literally how he's there full stop, let alone the idea that, you know, and I, I, he's one of I, you know, if you can get him in for 40 million, 45 million this window and pocket the rest and say, we're going to look at the summer, but we, we're doing this in the meantime, I'd say sound, he, he's your front three option. Let's see what happens. But it to me, it's... He's 26 years of age, Neil. That, that's the thing. I keep looking at him thinking he's 30 plus and that's the reason why no one touches him and the reason why we're not going there. He's 26, he's coming into his prime and... He's a funny one, Maris. If we signed him again, though, I'd be looking to drop him deeper. It's who you get for the front three, and it's such a... He such plays a, off the right, doesn't he, Maris? Yeah, yeah but I, I, if, he come, if he comes to us, I'd be, I'd be putting him in a number eight. I'd be putting him in one of the number eight positions. I'd, I I wouldn't be playing him in the front three for us. I think he'd slow us down. Massively, he's got a bit of pace about him, Morris. Yeah. I think he's. I think. I think what? Why? Quicker than Coutinho. I think why? he likes to play the game on his own pace, though, Rob. That's the mm. thing. Like, I think he he tries to dictate how Leicester play in the final third and and how quick they play. So I think a lot of it when Leicester are on it is because he's on it a lot of the time. And I think he he plays the game to his own level, no matter what. So. It's 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 a really hard. He one. plays. It's, to my mind, I've watched I've watched a bit of him in the last week, a bit more because of uh, and looked looked at some highlights reels because we've been linked so heavily to him until it all got poo poo. But he very much seems to me to play the Coutinho role, but off the right. But off the right. I, I think enough. the poo poo of it all is a little bit interesting as well because we we literally saw in the summer what happened when. Uh, clubs know that we're after one of their players. You know, we've got in Van Dyke, we've got a sort of a case in point for why you don't go around saying who it is that you're interested in and how much you you know that they want to play for the club and all that sort of stuff. I, I would be, I think, put it this way: I can see us finishing January making one or even two signings that are just totally out of left field that we haven't heard anything about. Uh, even with Mares, you know, Liverpool Football Club have withdrawn all interest in. Uh, Virgil van Dijk uh, playing for the club well that's funny because I know who scored the winner you know that happened in the summer and that's happened now you know Liverpool apparently contacted Leicester to say we're not interested in uh, in uh, in Mares. I wouldn't be surprised if we sign him I wouldn't be surprised if we sign somebody that we've heard nothing about because I think the club was really badly bitten with van Dijk in the summer uh, and and I think that all reporters at the end of the day rely on their sources to give them the information that they need and I think the club may well have turned around to all of the, all of the people who, who they usually use to leak things and said do not say a word about anybody we're not interested in anyone wouldn't surprise me 
Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I'd I, love to see us lumping for Sanchez. I mean, if we can do the oh, hypothetical yeah. lifts and butts. <laughs> I, I'm quite Alexis certain. Alexis Sanchez, tell. I'd I'm absolutely quite, I'm made quite, up with I'm that. Quite, well, I'm quite certain that Sanchez, is, that Sanchez has been full, thoroughly seduced by City. Yeah. He's got his heart set on City, etc., etc. That's the rational part of my brain. There's part of me thinking, why don't you just say to Arsenal, we'll give you 40 million quid. Say to Sanchez, we'll give you everything you want. We'll get Ricky Lambert to drive you up and down in a van <laughs> uh, from up and down the south, if need be, to come and play for us, lads. I would be absolutely, yeah. honestly, I would be... So obviously off for moving to the north now well, as well, I, yeah it's yeah. obviously for moving to the north you had a look at London can't be arsed with their tubes crap well it, 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 let's just uh, within the realms of the of the doable I think we're wrong to be ruling out Thomas Lamar so early as happening we can say oh, Mar- we, we, we can all sit back and go Monaco don't want to sell we've just been talked into selling our best player right my, my Lamar thing genuinely I'm, I'm Lamar's a midfielder and I'm, I am like that. I'm, so the reason why I'm not even talking about Lamar here, and by the way, I think there's every chance Lamar happens, but Lamar's a midfielder. Well, I'm, I'm not. I, I want a front three, lads. I want to can see in the front three. I I, see, I, what I see of Lamar, he looks front three enough to me. The other one, the other one, I think, which has been mentioned in dispatches as, a, as something that Liverpool have, t- have tried and so far but totally failed with, but they have tried it across, the, is to try and get Naby Keita earlier. But um, I don't know. They could try again. That's there's money, I th- there's money I just, burning a hole. I just think we, I, I think we're all going to sit and lament the sale of Coutinho and the fact that Liverpool aren't being linked with anyone and journalists to poo poo in left, right, and centre. But I, I honestly think that that's what's going to happen now because the Van Dyke thing really, I think you know, put the shitters up them basically in the in the summer, and we we now just think, I just think every, they're going to be playing it straight bat with every single link that comes our way until it's done and even Van Dijk is a case in point because it was just done it was all of a sudden announced we've done it we've signed him there yeah. he is mm. you know case in point nobody thought it was going to be done two days before the window was even open or media didn't really truly have a sniff on no, that Van that's Dijk, what I say no. so that, that, that I think is a case in point that is literally the last player we've signed the one we've been linked with for the entire summer came out of nowhere I think it's um, I think the last two games have just proved if you look at Miss and Mo Salah, how hard it is to play in that front three for us in, in terms of one of them wide forward positions and just the, the quality, the level required to be in that front three. And I think what we've seen from Salah not being there in the last two games is the ability to take the ball on the half turn, the ability to, to take the ball in, in different various positions of the pitch and, and be productive with it and hold it up and bring others into play and work those pockets in and around um, opposition fullbacks and stuff like that. And I think it's... It's a really, really specific skill set to to try and to try and master. And again, I go back to what I said at the start of the show. If if we can get a player to who's at the level of playing fifteen to twenty games now in that position, albeit even if half of them are a substitute, then I think that we need to try and do that. But it's very difficult. It's very specific, and I don't know who that is. If I'm being honest, we have one other option if we're unsuccessful in the transfer market. I think it's a bit. A bit soon for us to be calling that Liverpool don't want to do business or, or think it's unlikely that they can. But just let's assume it does work out. There is one big tactical option that Van Dyke offers, I think. He gives us the opportunity to do something Klopp's only dabbled with thus far, which is three at the back. Now, what three at the back does, if, especially if you've got a leader leading that three at the back, it's a quality three at the back, it takes the pressure off the num- the bodies that you need further up the pitch. Well, you Look at me, Neil. Look at me like I'm absolutely nuts. But here's a tip: to play th- three up front. What? You still play three up front? Not necessarily. So you play three five two. Ro- yes, exactly. Rog- Rogers your front two. Well, exactly. Your front two are perm any two from your your main three of Mane, Salah, and for me. Still attack a light. No, you're not. I still think you're an attack of light. I'm saying, I, I'm saying to you, Rob, I think you're an attack of light. You're now. You're, where, where, where are your I'm goals pl- coming from? I'm, I'm saying. Well, they all so- three of them contribute goals, right? So I've got, I've got. Look, Neil, if I've got t- people play three five two, if I've got two flying wings, only wing- really Conte, and only really this season, and only really when they haven't been as good in front of goal. And United and City and Arsenal. In this season, they played three five two. Oh, sorry, three at the back. Three at the back. Yes. Yeah. Uh, City. City have. Got rid of three five two when they've decided they don't want to play Aguero and he's just they've had a look at it, fucked it off. Arsenal are playing three really good points. Hang on, hear me out. Threats. Let me give you my team. Uh, the th- forget the, the three centre halves. I've got say arguably Chan or Henderson at the base right, of my midfield, a uh, midfield three. And I've got Lalana and uh, Chamberlain ahead, and then ahead of them I've got two of Mane, Salah, or Firmino. That's only when I'm rotating, by the way, when the games are coming thick and fast. If the games are seven days apart, I don't want to do that. But if I, I'm just saying that is an option which go, enables you to play just two of the three but still have a lot of attacking bodies on the pitch because you can have Lalana and Chamberlain together, which I don't think you can have in a 4-3-3. I get that, Rob, but I think if you if you put that to Jürgen Klopp, he says, that's our mate, but I'm playing Sadio Mane right wing-back. 
Do you know what I mean? That's what I yeah. did. I, I was. I, I think that's. I don't think you're gonna get what you need in from that wing back position in Joe Gomez. Or and I'm not. Be, I'm not damning him with faint praise or even Alberto Moreno. I think Klopp would want some kind of hybrid attacker slash defender. Man of jack of all trades to master that formation. I, I get it; it's an option. A tinkering in formation is an option, and, and I think yeah, he's got. He's, he's got to be looking at. No, yeah, it's not. It's not worth ruling out. I think he, he's going to be looking at everything now. I'd going rather forward. just buy a boss player. Oh yeah, trust me. Yeah, yeah. that one all yeah. day long. I'm, just, I'm I'm planning for a my merge. worry. My worry is that is that there is cleverness going on, and I just almost rather rather rescue cleverness, and I just be trying to buy a boss player. I'll be with that first and foremost. Totally. Over then to the football, if we are talking about the tactics and all of that sort of stuff, Liverpool beat Everton by two goals to one uh, on Friday night. And we beat the shite on a Friday night <laughs> and they hardly touched the ball. Uh, the ball? They did touch the ball a fair yeah, bit. Yeah, they did actually, a bit more than we thought. <laughs> a bit more than we expected, a bit more than we thought. They, um, It was a sweet, sweet way to, to win the game, uh, Adam. But one of the things that strikes me is that Virgil van Dijk seems very much born to play the Dane. I, I think... It's very difficult, isn't it, to get to stop yourself from getting excited when you see a player have a really good performance like that. But I, I think, rightly or wrongly, there are vast swathes of Liverpool fans, swathes, swathes, swathes of Liverpool fans, <laughs> uh, who uh, who will allow a first impression to dictate how they feel about the entire future of a player. And I think, you know, that we have seen in Virgil van Dijk there a performance. He came on and within two minutes you could see him barking orders, telling people where to be, giving the instructions out. There were more than a couple of occasions in the second half where he said to the goalkeeper, this is yours. And that is what we have been crying out for since Carragher retired, basically. Somebody in that back line who would take the defence and the goalkeeper the scruff of the neck and say, this is how we're going to play. And make no mistake, Carragher had bad games, but he still never shut up, even when he was having a bad game. He, he talked and talked and talked and talked the players through what they needed to do. And Van Dijk will have bad games for Liverpool, but we... The reason Klopp was so desperate for him is because I think he identified a massive flaw in this Liverpool defence, which is a lack of conversation and a lack of somebody drilling others to say, this is what you need to do. And I think you will see, perhaps, from other defenders, them lift their game because they're seeing somebody else do it. There's something on, Rob, the idea that this fella's spent four months, possibly seven months, eight months, imagine now he comes in and plays centre half for Liverpool. Mm. That was one of the things I was so that that struck me. Like the idea that he's been watching our games more than he's been doing his Southampton homework yeah. for the last four months. And one of the things that struck me was this is someone who who decided who's decided he's turning up and he's being this guy from minute one. When Southampton came to Anfield, I didn't think he was anywhere near as active <laughs> as he was as he was for us there I think it's, it really struck me that he, it's the idea that either the manager said to him this is what I want you to do or he's just thought you know what I'm just going to come in and do this I am making this first impression I am being this guy for a minute one and I think that's what you saw Yes I'm the defence consultant as much as just a, another body on the pitch Yeah you know we'd, we we could be sort of setting ourselves up for the fall but he looked the part and he looked the part whilst also suggesting there's a hell of a lot more to come as well um, because it wasn't a perfect game to, I think for him to come into in some respects I was I was thinking about this the other day because a lot of the, the conversations around Van Dyke coming in, I think a lot of cynically have felt, is he just are we setting him up for a fall? Because systemically, do we play in a way that we would expose every centre half that ever came to Liverpool and they'll all end up looking shit? Just give it another week or two. I was reminded by his performance that I don't think this is going to be the case here. Um, and it reminded me of something that happened towards the end of Kenny Dalglish's reign for Liverpool. If we can go back a bit here, it's something that sort of stayed with me. And you know, you have moments in your football education in your life, and you go, "Ah, that." There was a point in about 1990, I think it was, in Liverpool's last title-winning year, where where both I think Hansen was out almost semi permanently with injury, and Gary Gillespie had picked up, started to pick up a lot of injuries. And Liverpool were playing quite often as a centre-half pairing. Somebody might correct me. The likes of Gary Ablett, Steve Staunton being brought inside, maybe Nickel being asked to do a job. Lads who were just just weren't sort of near the world-class level of the likes of Hansen and Gillespie. Liverpool just suddenly started conceding a shitload of goals. From having been an absolute machine of not conceding goals, could score goals because of all the great attacking players, didn't concede them because they had really good defenders. It was really that binary. 
they were sh- these lads were not at the same class as Hansel and Gillespie, and we conceded goals. Now we've sort of talked. To, what I'm saying is, I hope this 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 might apply because look, Van Dyke looks to me a lot better defender than the lads that we've been watching week in week out, and maybe him and maybe one other. It could make a difference here, a big difference. I think all of that is, is spot on. Um, I think the the organisational elements of Virgil Van Dijk is something that has has been identified and something that he will contribute to. But I think tactically is the reason he's been brought in, and I think you will see a different tactic from the pool in the second half of the season. And you'd only seen it a couple of times the other night. But the big switch to Gomez, the big switch, the quality of passion, long range passion on him is unbelievable. Yes, it is. And I think. We've seen it quite a lot this season. We've seen it in pre-season at Wigan, Neil, where we overload in one area of the pitch and then suddenly we work it so we get a big switch so yep. we can isolate a one-on-one. And I think that's what he's been brought in for. I think you'll see a lot more of that. We'll flood the left side a little bit and we'll we'll make opposition think that we're going to attack them down there. The ball will get worked back to him and it'll either be a first or second time ball where it's a big switch on. And the quality of pass, he puts it on Gomez's foot twice to the level that I don't think any of our other centre-halves can do um, over about 40, 50 yards. I think that's predominantly the reason he's been brought in. And just going back to what I said before, I think it's a really important position on the pitch for Liverpool because fundamentally Jürgen Klopp only believes in having two defenders on the pitch and a goalkeeper in terms of defensive play. I think everyone else is a hybrid makeshift attacker in some way, as well as they are a defender. Um, but having two out and out defenders on the pitch is what he believes in, and they have to be the best that they can possibly be to for this Liverpool side to function. Now, the other good thing about him, I think, as well, is he'll bring out better in the other centre half, whoever he's playing with, mm. albeit Matip or, or Lovren. Matip and looked better, didn't he? For he that? did, but I think in general the feeling of the ball coming into our final third and the set pieces we defended, I was just a lot. I was a lot more assured and. He did bark a lot for Southampton, Neil. First half, um, he organised a lot against Liverpool earlier on the season. So he has got that in his locker. But just a, he just brings it. He just brought a general sense of reassurance to me when we were defending as as a whole the other night. I thought. I did think when the ball came high into the box, I suddenly thought I remembered the feeling when Sammy Hoopier was there. When this doesn't have to be a nightmare. This this no. doesn't have to be. No. This lad is is the biggest lad who's the most aggressive who can deal with this situation that's his thing he can do this I think it's important as well as a moment in, in the, the first five or ten where Balassi gets around him and there's about three of our players who just cover him and get him out of it and I think there's a little bit of a trust there both ways and that he thinks alright yeah me, me lads are going to sort me out here you know, I can I can obviously settle into this I'm not going to be overexposed in any way I'm not going to be um finding myself dealing with one-on-ones or all the stereotypes that come with the lazy media narrative about Liverpool defence is that it's just this this cowboy gung-ho type of football and I think he's seen that this team works for each other. You can definitely buy into that. He's, he's a really good player, I think. There's a, a story I always remember from um, the filming of A Few Good Men, um, the Aaron Sorkin uh, play turned into a film. And I, I'm fairly certain it was Tom Cruise telling the story that they were doing table reads of the script where, every, where all the actors sit round and you just read through it line by line. And uh, everybody was doing it and it was all going fine, blah, blah, blah. And then it got to Jack Nicholson's first scene and he said he took it through the roof and you saw everybody around the table sit up and go, Jesus, this is the level we're doing at the table read. We've got to up our game here. And that this feels a little bit like that, 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 that just even just having him there and the level that he's going to work at as it will make everybody else sit up and go, we need to up our game. We need to sort ourselves out. We need to do these things. Even when he's not playing, you might find somebody going, we need to do the things that he was instructing us to do because we were better when he was on the pitch. And imbue with confidence. That's a very yeah. important thing. And I think that's why I, well, I mean, again, you can imagine what you're seeing sometimes, but I think that's why we saw more composed Matip. I think knowing you've got that lad next to you, if you, it gives you everybody a few percent more confidence in their defending. Uh, the entire performance was... Not great. Uh, Liverpool weren't very good. They weren't maybe quite as bad as we all thought they were on Friday night watching it back down. But they, 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 they weren't. It wasn't a terrific performance. We'd looked one attack and play a light. Um, but we've ended Everton's season. Uh, we quite possibly ended Sam Allardyce's career. 
um, with the victory. Uh, and Everton can't play much better than that. And they still came up short. They still came up lacking. When they get the goal to make it 1-1, that's probably off the back of our best 10 minutes in the game. And they just managed to hit us with a good counter. Fair play to Phil Jagielka. He does absolutely brilliantly, all things considered. And I think that's probably the best bit of play from anyone in the whole match, is Jagielka having the, the balls to make the 80-yard run and then yeah. the composure to knock it back inside and find Sigurdsson. It's a good finish. Our goalkeeper should do better. But the important thing is they can't play much better than that, and yet they still weren't, weren't able to lay a proper glove on us. No, they are... I mean... Look, it's it's important to say we don't play well. We don't. I think our two number eights don't play well enough in terms of getting us in positions of being in the final third and getting in and around Everton's fullbacks. Everton, when they've not got the ball, they've got a bank of four and a bank of five, almost routinely regimentedly. And and I think they put so much into into that game in terms of the first seventy minutes that two things happen to them: they tire first and foremost, but the equalise. And the worst thing that they can do in a football match is be on a level par with Liverpool because they <laughs> inevitably just find a way to be Everton again and to just have this subconscious element of, oh no, we have a, an actual chance of going and putting one on Liverpool here. And they just all the time revert to type in terms of of, of what they are. And, and they have got a real, real fundamental subconscious issue with this football club them and and I don't see how they get round it because they are awful after they equalise. They do not lay a glove on Liverpool after they equalise and it's 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 a really good goal that they score and they should get so much half from it because the ball's in the net in five passes and for all the times Gibbo's point the other week about the Leicester goal is really good and that sometimes you need to look at the opposition's goal. We can maybe get tighter to Luchman when it breaks but all in all, that's a fantastic counter attack. Happy made that we scored. If I was in that stand, if I was in that away end, I'd be sniffing blood and I'd be saying, "Let's go and get a winner here." And let's not take them back to our place. Let's go and get a winner. But the minimum is we take them back. But they find a way to be fundamental Everton again and find a way to almost woe is me lose to Liverpool because that's what they're used to. That's what they do. And it's it's just it's it's fascinating. It's intriguing. I also think it's about us though, Dan. I think we found a way to deal with adversity in a football match. It's yeah. funny, a funny thing's happened to us in the last 10 days. We've won quietly won three football matches, 2-1, from having uh, to having to get a goal back, from having been pulled back or gone behind in, in all three of them. And in all three of them, we've had to get relatively late winners. I think it's going to... They've probably been our poorest performances in many respects of the last... in the period since the Tottenham defeat. Certainly Burnley and... I'd say that that's fair about Burnley and Everton. Even Leicester to a degree. It's not a... Yeah, there are periods where we're good there's periods where it flags up but definitely yeah Burnley and Everton but I think what's happened in these last three games will stand us in good stead I felt I suppose just because of the momentum of the previous two games even after they equalised we definitely had another goal in us there yeah. we definitely <coughs> to be fair to the manager he made shit or bust substitutions um, people were expecting him to hook Mane. He didn't. He added attackers. He took Gomez off. He took it off. All, all, all pretense at any defensive protection there. He just went for it. I think, actually, uh, I know we're not talking about Burnley, but just to touch on it because I think it links. I, I, I think Burnley was one of our best performances of the season because we didn't play how we normally play. We went to really dog fair. it out and we dogged it out and we absolutely did. And I think the reason we were poor against Everton is because we thought we were going to have to do that again. I think we thought we were going to face 11 men behind the ball, which we did for periods, there's no question. But I think I don't think we Klopp expected Everton to play anywhere near as expansive as they did. And, and I think maybe some of the players he had on were expecting to have a bit of a dog of a game and didn't really have one. So, you know, I, I think that's why it wasn't particularly good and I also think that that part of the reason we struggled is that, that for the first time in a while actually we lost the midfield battle I think it was a game too far for Chan I think he looked like he'd played two games in the space of 48 hours and two hard fought games in 48 hours yeah I thought I thought, I thought Chan week. looked he looked like Adam he looked like he'd he looked like he'd had those games yeah, exactly. to be, to be That's really fair he was to brilliant him. in those games well he was very good in portions in both of those games as well and so I think that's what he looked like and I also think he what he's not helped by having 
Milner alongside him. I think Milner had good moments. The penalty was great, but he's you know his speed of play is slower than the passage of time. So we have to you know acknowledge that Chan's not a particularly quick player. Milner's not a particularly quick player. Uh, I think Lalana, who I thought was brilliant against Burnley, looked like a lad who'd been out for yeah, the best part of six poor, months. Yeah. And you know, and so you've got basically essentially no midfield. I thought I, I thought Oxley Chamberlain. I was I, I was really fascinated to see people say they thought Oxley Chamberlain was brilliant. I saw some you know kind of um, big accounts giving man of the match and things, and I, and I actually thought it was one of his poorest games for us. And I really like Agreed. him. It, and I because I thought his passing was really sloppy, which let down the play because you don't have a midfield that can run onto the end of a of a ball. So I think I, I think that there were players who expected to, to have to dog it out. There were players who were just knackered, and and so we kind of lost the midfield, and that gave Everton Everton heart. Um, but as Dan quite correctly said, when all said and done, they're still Everton, and they Everton it. So you know, um, yeah, it's uh, I think it's notable and interesting that we've we've been a lot better from set pieces the last two games. So if you're taking Everton and Burnley in context, I think it's. It, it's important to say that we were definitely a bit more attritional in both of those games, that we, we didn't work to to be this free-flowing, expansive football team that we probably look for our moments in games. And, and you're right, Rob, a lot of... I mean, it's fully down to Liverpool that they go and win that game. But in the way that they go and win it from a corner, in the way that they go and win Burnley from a free kick into the box, that they're hungry to go and get on the end of those chances means yeah. that they probably might have... You know, proportion the percentage of where chances are going to come from, and adjusted that slightly to where they usually would do in terms of how they get in behind teams to to in these games. Saying, "Well, lads, we need to make sure these set pieces count. We need yes. to make sure." I, I I I mean, we were getting in behind Everton at a will a, a little fade down the left a lot. R- Robertson and Mane were beginning to have quite a lot of joy, and we were forced. I think yeah. from not getting a corner maybe in the first half to starting to get corners for fun, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Van Dijk. Well, he scores from the corner, but he he nearly scores from the better chance, doesn't and he? And Gomez should as well, shouldn't he? Gomez, Gomez, Gomez and Van Dijk have Yeah, and, oh, and yeah. it's also, having said that, I thought Oxford Chamberlain didn't have a particularly good game. It is noteworthy, especially now with the loss of Coutinho, that, that we've scored from two set pieces that he's taken. You know, that's worth drawing attention to as well. Yeah, they've gone to Dubai now and they've got a few days to regroup. But <laughs> I think if we take Everton in the, the cluster of the Christmas fixtures, then the legs, the heavy touch... The misplaced pass, it's kind of understandable given the, the amount of games, the amount of minutes, the frequency of minutes that we've had to play. So if you're looking back at, at that group of fixtures and we're saying we dog a 2-1 at home to Everton in the last 10 minutes and we're a bit leggy and we're not quite on it, then in the context of the Christmas period, I'm absolutely fine with that. I'm fine with beating Everton any time, but if we're looking at it in that context, sound. I and think the club in the country had a had a more successful Christmas period than us. Others have had the same Christmas period, but no one's had a better Christmas period mm. than us. But we need, to, we need to say, actually, as well, well, I need to say, that was one of the most enjoyable victories over Everton I can remember <laughs> in a long time, and it, and it trounces all the 4 nils. You know, yeah. that and Mane scoring last year. They're the narrow ones, they're the best. Just because there was 8,000 of them in the ground, they could have had you should have just given the whole yeah, of main that stand. really helped make it sweet, didn't it? There were so many because yeah. their celebration was I don't know what it was. It was like war had broken out. It was unreal. They won the World Cup. Everything everything gone yeah. right and wrong in one mo- mad moment. You're, you're allowed a big let off in an yeah. away game like that one. I mean, we just did do Burnley, where I, as I've said in the we, past, do you think I thought, we look like that? I, yes, I think I, 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 I thought well, we were, it's messy, isn't it? I thought we were going to die at Burnley. I think you're allowed that. But I just want to I want to come back to I want to come back to the left back Robertson again. I haven't watched yeah. the game back on the night. I felt it was very much a performance where he was battling and where he was showing tons and tons of needle and tons and tons of fight watching it back I'm actually really impressed with his all-round performance I think he plays mm. really well Rob I think he could well be our strongest performer on on, on the night um, he's he, it's funny isn't it it's funny with, with, with us and full backs in general we do we, we maybe don't pass them enough at times we we, we, we tend to ignore them in, in, in stretches but I, I think that's a that's very much a game he can he can look to genuinely build on, and by build on I mean look to be in the in the proper mix to be starting to get big games at left back for Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, he does. I mean, that was that was his best performance I think in the, since his Liverpool career. He's played a lot of games quietly now. Whether it's the spectre of uh, of Albi Moreno coming back in time for City made him up at upper level. Maybe, maybe. That's I think he just enjoyed the derby. I think, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it sounds a cliche thing to say, but maybe as a, as a British player, there's something about him that sort of, 
it has some Derby DNA in him that, that they just made him think I have to, I have to be that much better. I kind of maybe he more viscerally gets whatever to now when they're in the ground than a lad who's born in a far foreign land. I think he, I think he has as much as a a whole game that he, he's going to get in terms. What I mean by that is in terms of what he was used to playing for a whole because. I think that the way the game starts and pans out ultimately dictates the type of performance he's going to have. If Everton do not engage at all like they do in December, then the onus is on him to be an, an attacking left back. But I th- it, it reminded me a lot of Milner against City last season and, and against Sterling, where he just found himself in these one on ones with Balassi all the time. Balassi, he, I thought, was a threat. He, he was. Threat. Well, they, they identified him as their out, didn't they? And they wanted him on the ball all the time and they wanted to get the ball to him. And I think fair play to Robertson, he really dealt with them one-on-ones and he was really concentrated and switched on for them. But they're the type of games he was probably involved in a lot last season. Yeah. So they're the type of games that he's not had enough of, if you ask him, probably. And he's probably had to learn a different type of being a left-back Um type of football so I think it was a good performance from him you know I thought um, I thought he showed tons of energy I thought that he, he was really up for it as well um, and yet it just reminded me a lot of Milner and Sterling for some reason last season I think it was I think what will be interesting is is presuming he plays against City how he plays against City because I think you're spot on Dan, about the type of game it was and that's not the type of game that he's going to get I think against City so it'll be interesting to see how he steps up to the plate when we face them and, and how he responds to it. Um, but Do you think he keeps his place if Moreno's fit? I think he does for City because I think it's Just too. I think out. that's too much of a game to bring somebody who's who's not play who's not match fit. I think it's too important yeah. a game to bring somebody back in. So I'd be surprised if he doesn't. And I think Milner is now not a left back anymore, uh, for shame. And so I think we'll kind of you know stick with him as it is, and it'll be interesting to see. But he'll go into that game thankfully with a lot of confidence. And what will help is that supporters will have a lot of confidence in him because we won't have to, you know, we won't be watching yeah. thinking, oh, is he going to make a mistake by all mm-hmm. because we've just seen him basically boss a derby. And, 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 it's, and he will take a lot of heart because Balassi was their best player and he, you know, basically had him in his back pocket for the majority of the time. Uh, one word on the goalkeeper, Rob, is I think it's a difficult, I think it's a difficult save to make. I think that the... I think Sigurdsson takes it really well. It's unerring in terms of where it's going. He strikes it well. It's a good counter attack. Is he unsighted? Before. Is he unsighted? He may or may not be. It doesn't look great though. And when it is your only shot to save, it's it's the the issue that the the, the, the I think the biggest issue that there is around Carius in general is whether it's through circumstance or design. He's not really getting to make his case very much, if you know what I mean, in a proper sense. He's not getting to sort of be able to say, you you should be picking me yeah. instead of that fella. Uh, you know, I think we can all have whatever view that you've got on Mignolet, on the level of Mignolet. I mean, I was. Uh, did you watch match today last night, Rob? <laughs> no, you're going to tell me some shit keeper performances. F- fucking endless, mate. It was, I, I was watching match today just thinking of you and basically <laughs> practically every other, <laughs> every, not having Mignolet. every other Premier League goalkeeper who played yesterday was an absolute fucking It's Loris, clown. wasn't it? Was it no, Loris? I, no, Loris hasn't played, but uh, Loris hasn't played, but um, what's his name? Uh, both Butland and um, and Ben what. Foster might as well have, honestly, okay. honestly, honestly. Do you know what? Can I actually have I mean, you're going to make me do this. I, I tell you who I've watched a lot of recently because I watched him against us and then I watched the full Chelsea Arsenal game and another performance. I really like Peter Cech. I think he may not be the Peter Cech he was, but I think he's a marvelous goalkeeper. They're all having. They're, there are Arsenal podcasts that are about they whether or not off. whether or not we should get rid of Peter Cech because he's finished. They're, I'm he's just not. saying, mate. I'm just saying that. They that's won't what, come watch that's our what, lads. That's what, our, that's what Arsenal are currently talking about because they're watching that goalkeeper every week and you're not. Um, Neil, Arky, we Neil, need a new I'm more keeper. pissed off with the one he drops, by the way. With the, the yeah, cross, I'm more yeah, pissed so off with that than the goal. Well, I, 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 I wasn't at the game. I couldn't get. I couldn't get a ticket. I wasn't at the game, but, it, but. He, he doesn't drop it. He's barged into by one of our players. Now, you could say he should have firmer hands and things, okay, but he, he didn't dro- It wasn't hands. dropped. Somebody barged into him, which is slight. I think it, it, there, the words are important when you're talking about those sorts of things because he doesn't just drop one. it when no one's around him. The, the problem I've got is I don't think Simon Mignolet saves that goal at Everton score. I don't think he saves it because he doesn't get ones that go in but by his near post on a regular basis. Uh, and that, that, I, 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 I think point. it's entirely fair to say that you know Butland isn't good enough, that Foster isn't good enough. That's fine, but neither is Mignolet. Manchester United aren't coming out to buy Mignolet if they sell De Gea. And <laughs> Liverpool <laughs> should have a goalkeeper that, that is one of the you know one of the top players around. And the reality is that I I I. I 
Would you I buy think all black ahead of Lamar? I, I, well, I, yeah, I would. I absolutely would. I, I am terrified by how little the, the manager... The, my only problem with Klopp is how little importance he seems to put on the goalkeeper. And I, I think the, the we would probably have conceded half the goals we've conceded if we had a top-class goalkeeper, or at least a significantly better goalkeeper than we have. Now, I agree, loads of the Premier League goalkeepers are shite. That's totally fine, but we don't want to buy them. I don't want us going out to buy West no. Brom's goalkeeper. I don't give I, a shit. I don't want Jack I, I, Exactly. I've no, got I no either. desire to see him. Yeah. I don't want us taking a sideways step and the idea that we should just replace Mignolet with anyone no that is absolute nonsense but we need to replace Mignolet if we are serious about trying to win major trophies we need to have somebody in the goal who will rescue your club Mignolet doesn't do it Carius doesn't do it the only thing I've ever said about Carius is I, if I was if I could take carte blanche and go up to Jurgen Klopp I would say play him for the rest of the season because coming in coming out coming in coming out it's widely acknowledged that's not a great thing for a goalkeeper to do because they need to get a bit of rhythm they need to get it. if it was any other position we'd say oh well he hasn't got of the rhythm of the team he doesn't understand his teammates we somehow think that think that goalkeepers are these magical players that can just come in for a one-off game and they'll be sound because they're a goalie and they're on their own they're not what, people talk about Liverpool's back four it's not it's a back five and the goalkeeper is a crucial part of that and I don't think either of them are good enough and I personally would make a goalkeeper the number one signing that we make and if we end this window with selling continuum and by nobody else except we go and get a top class goalkeeper then I will be dancing around Liverpool City Centre naked because that is the most important thing we can do. Neither of them are good enough. I, and it's irrelevant that night that the the lads in you know Stoke throw one in every now and again. I don't give a shit because I, I don't want him. Do you know I'm what I mean? Like, that. That's what I think. I'm absolutely fine with that. What I've got a problem with is when people run their mouths off and say things like, "I take any, people." I, I take, <laughs> he is the worst goalkeeper in the league. When people say things like Mignolet is the worst that's, goalkeeper in the league, that's league. entirely that is totally it's fair. absolute he's bullshit. He's not the worst goalkeeper in the league. He's definitely not. He is no. probably in the top six goalkeepers, but he's not in the top four. He did drop it, though, in my life. He did drop it. <laughs> <laughs> he did drop it. I'm not having it. He dropped it. Uh, all right, then. Uh, and there's been your Anfield wrap this week. We've gone all the way around the house. Thank you very much to Paul Joyce for coming on. Oh, but, oh one more thing, actually. Fourth round of the Cup, Rob. Uh, we don't know the draw is yet because it's happening on Monday evening. <sighs> I'm ready to fume about this, by the way. Uh, it's fucking ridiculous. It's happening on Monday evening. Um, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's happening on Monday evening. They could just do it this evening. And well, go I've from only there, it. Um, yeah. it's, it's on BBC Two, thankfully. It's not on the one show. Um, but... I mean, it's Eggheads. it better be some bums. It better be some absolute bums. Do you want, do you want Danny Dyer doing it from the Queen? Uh, yeah, I want. I want. I do. do you I want s- bums at home? Yeah, I want bums, at, bums at home, please. Bums at home. What do you want? Yeah, bums galore, please, for the next two rounds. I I would like a team that we can beat, but have to take mildly seriously because I want a cup run. I, 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 but then, do you know what? I've actually got a hell of a lot more faith in the squad in general than some people. Do seem you want to Leicester have. at home? <laughs> no, I got no. That's what I say. Somebody mildly all right that we can definitely beat. That's what I, th- I know. That's a difficult <laughs> one. To beat, but if somebody could sort that, bums, I want the mate. shittest team in that draw. I <laughs> yeah, want them I at home. Oh, well, like, yeah, obviously. If we I'd take get, that. honestly, I mean, I'd, the odds on getting I'd Everton was one hundred and twenty-eight to one, wasn't it? Something like that there was ridiculous odds what are the odds on us getting Barca yeah, I've got a th- yeah, exactly. I've got a theory don't they were in it, we'd get them <laughs> you get one good you get another and I've always yeah. thought this it just happens it's just you, you just think go on we deserve a, a better draw now and then it's just fucking shit city away or something like that so do you know we'll, 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 we'll do well in the FA Cup this year but it'll be harder to win the FA Cup than the Champions League <laughs> <That'd> be hysterical <laughs> yeah. be hysterical every round like some sort of like some sort of city knockout next, of a, yeah. Yeah. Chelsea then United we do win. Arsenal next one's Arsenal away yeah. then we've got ourselves a little bit of a sniff of United at home and then we move to Chelsea Spurs Chelsea in the semis yeah. Spurs in the semis and then City in the final and then uh, we go to Pens against Wigan in the final. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I don't know what we're all on about. Everton shall not be moved anyway, as they were singing the other night. So they will not be moved. They will not I be moved. I'll tell you what, that is, a, that is a nice monkey off the back to not to know they're out that competition. Because I'll tell you what I don't want them, is them in the semis, them in the quarters. Yeah. I, they, no. they had a lot of here we go the other night. Did you oh, know? they yeah, did have a here we go. go. I was pissing I myself. <laughs> here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. <laughs> they did go, to be fair. Yes. They went out. They exactly. went out. Liverpool went through. Philip Coutinho has gone to Barcelona. People are going absolutely everywhere, but the Reds march on in the FA Cup this season. It's really weird me in the FA Cup. In the third round, I don't care about the idea of the glory. I'm all about the event and the magic of the FA Cup. Come the fourth round, I'm thinking, we can win this, you know. 